It was the summer of 1983. I was a 22-year-old college student serving an internship at the only Chicago broadcast market television station that would take me. The network VHF stations, WBBM, WLS, WMAQ, WTTW, and the independent WGN all required a B average, and formal academia was never my strength. I spotted WCFC TV 38 in a 1982 copy of Broadcast Yearbook, a trade publication that listed names and telephone numbers of station management. An internship was a requirement for graduation at Harding University's mass communication program. So I wrote to station manager Harold Wheat, got an interview, and while home on break, borrowed my dad's black leather wingtip shoes and jumped onto the Metro Chicago Northwestern line from West Chicago into the city. The interview went well, and the next summer I found myself standing behind an RCA TK760 Plumicon 3-tube broadcast studio camera in a tiny studio known as the two-car garage on the 44th floor of Chicago's Kemper Building at 20 North Wacker Drive. ...for you today with lots of special reports, but first we want you to know that our counseling lines are open, and Wally Sutton, our ministries director, will be on later in the show, and he'll pray for some of those requests and give us some praise reports. If you'd like to call in and pray with our counselors, in Chicago the number is 9... WCFC TV 38 was, in some ways, a typical television station. Cameras, studios, sets, lights, videotape machines, a master control, offices, but in other ways, more profound ways, WCFC TV 38 was different. The call letters WCFC stood for Winning Chicagoland for Christ. At the time, TV 38 was the largest independent Christian television station in America and part of an emerging trend that saw the rise and public fall of famous televangelists like Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart, the emergence of the religious right on the conservative political landscape, and a mainstreaming of the American Pentecostal movement. Well, he begins to fight, but then we find ourselves back on our knees saying, Oh Lord, help me please, he'll be there, listen. And in more subtle ways, TV 38 also nurtured a grassroots ecumenical movement that crossed ecclesial, racial, and economic barriers that had divided Christians in Chicago for decades. When I'm depressed or anything, I put channel 38 on and I get over it, and I think it's a wonderful channel. We wanted to let you know that the kids especially appreciate the cartoon shows in the afternoon and Saturdays. Tell me how you came to know Jesus. Well, it's through watching 700 Club on Channel 38. Because TV 38 was an independent television station operating on a shoestring as a nonprofit with non union labor, WCFC was free to create a vast array of local programming, many of which were then syndicated nationally, including an influential gospel music program, Saturday Night Sing, an exercise program, Shape Up with Nancy Larson, Bible Baffle, a Christian game show, Young at Heart, a Southern gospel music program, Solid Rock Video, which covers Christian contemporary music, an elaborate live-action children's puppet program featuring Ringling Brothers face clown Leon McBride called Toddler's Friends, and dozens of documentaries and other local programs, including my own weekly news magazine, Page Two. Manhattan Melodrama was a film playing at Chicago's Biograph Theater. It was all broadcast live on television, and I had a front row seat. The electronic church was really a culmination of decades of uh, evangelical and conservative Protestants' uh, attempts to try and uh, reach out to their culture that had centered on broadcasting. At first with radio, beginning back in the 1920s and 30s, individual pastors and sometimes denominations would attempt to create their own radio shows. Ever since Guillermo Marconi's first transmitter in 1895, Christians in America recognized that broadcasting was a powerful tool. 
On July 18, 1920, Reverend Clayton B. Wells, the pastor of Fairmount Congregational Church in Wichita, Kansas, began preaching his sermons over parishioner C.A. Stanley's private wireless station, 9BW. Pastor Wells chanced to pass and dropped into the station. He took me to task for not having attended morning service, and then and there suggested that henceforth the radio station on the Lord's Day be devoted to the Lord's work. I immediately took down Mr. Wells' sermon and transmitted it to hundreds of stations within hearing. Now it has become an established custom to send out these sermons every Sunday evening at 7.30. About the same time, Pastor M. E. Dodd of the First Baptist Church in Shreveport, Louisiana, installed a 200-watt broadcast station on a 360-meter wavelength so that his aged mother, 400 miles away, could hear him preach. The transmitter used the church spire as an antenna. According to one report, membership increased 400% and contributions increased 3,000%. In Chicago, Paul Rader, pastor of Chicago's Moody Church, began a series of periodic broadcasts from City Hall on June 3, 1922. Three years later, Rader began regular radio broadcasts over station WHT. Rader agreed to provide 15 hours of programming every Sunday featuring preaching and music. Go out and tell the world. Go give them the news. Take it to Africa, take it to South America, take it to Mexico, to Central America, to America, to Canada, take it to China, take it to Indochina, Siam, Anam, go down to Borneo, around to the islands of the sea, wherever you find them, go, and I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, I am with you all the days, even unto the end of the age. About the time popular public radio broadcasting began to emerge in America, the Christian renewal movement, known as Pentecostalism, soon recognized radio's potential as a way to preach a gospel message that included spiritual gifts like speaking in tongues and divine healing to a wide audience. And when those shining silver towers were lifted up above our temple dome and flashed the message east, west, north, and south, our opportunity. Pentecostals have always been very passionate about spreading the gospel and they were often willing to use modern methods to tell the old, old story. They said we should be able to use modern methods while keeping the authority of scripture, while sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the earliest radio stations that was owned by a church was KFSG in Los Angeles. Amy Semple McPherson, the famous Pentecostal evangelist who founded the Foursquare denomination. She was Assemblies of God prior to that. She also founded uh, a radio station, which was a very important pioneering effort in Christian media. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. One of the broadcasters who really came up with the predominant strategy it was Charles Fuller out in California, his old-fashioned revival hour. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. His radio program was syndicated on hundreds and hundreds of stations across the country through the medium of electronic transcriptions, you know, basically these... Uh, records that would be sent out to uh, radio stations all across the country every week. Between 1920 and 1948, radio broadcasting became the dominant form of electronic communication in America. Following World War II, a new medium, television, emerged as a growing phenomena that changed American culture forever. Roman Catholic, Evangelical Protestant, Protestant mainline, and especially Pentecostal Christians, quickly recognized the potential of the new medium and began to create programs. From his limbs and heal him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. The advent of television coincided with a great healing revival in American Christianity. So you had people like Oral Roberts, William Branham, 
uh, T.L. Osborne, uh, A.A. Allen, and others who wanted to reach the masses. So they were engaging in mass revivalism, mass evangelism, and they're wondering, how can I reach more people with the gospel? What became uh, increasingly obvious to these conservative Protestant broadcasters was they did not have an equal access to airtime as did their more mainline, mainstream Protestant uh, rivals. So what they had to do was uh, create their own broadcast environments and often that entailed chaining together a number of different stations and uh, in sort of uh, independent broadcasts and then raising funds from their listeners. So by the time the 1970s roll along, they had sort of honed this into an art. Fulton Sheen, the uh, Catholic priest was with the penetrating eyes, was about all there was on, <clears throat> on television along with the Billy Graham Crusades from time to time. But I'd say by the mid to late 70s, that's when you'd, you really started to see more of the local pastor, whether it was Bob Schuler out in Garden Grove or Jerry Falwell at Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, and then some of the more, let's just say, flamboyant uh, types. In the early 70s, the uh, charismatic movement was beginning, I think, to stir in the entire Chicagoland area. The Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship, uh, headed by Demas Shikarian at that time, and it was a a very exciting and growing group. At the same time, there was another woman evangelist by the name of Catherine Kuhlman, who was drawing tremendous crowds here in Chicago. Jesus staked everything that he had on the Holy Ghost. Remember that. Never forget it. The Son of the Living God staked absolutely everything, and I do not mean to be sacrilegious when I word it just as I have. I mean it just. When network television emerged in the 1950s, mainstream Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish organizations were guaranteed free airtime each Sunday because the Federal Communication Commission, or FCC, gave public interest credit to networks and their stations for providing free airtime to these mainstream religious entities. In some cases, networks actually paid for the program production. Pentecostal and fundamentalist groups were often excluded from this agreement. Everything changed for religious broadcasting in 1960 when the FCC ruled that local stations could now sell airtime earmarked for religious programs and still get public interest credit. Pentecostal groups, comfortable with a market-based approach to religion, were eager to buy commercial time, once given to mainstream groups, for free. He said to one man, dip in River Jordan seven times, and when he dipped, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Hallelujah! As TV stations and radio stations began to adapt their public service time quotients and how they figured uh, out uh, ways to uh, sort of handle that sort of a requirement from the Federal Communications Commission, the mainline Protestants began to back away from media because they had been used to having so much free time simply given to them um, that they were sort of lost in that new uh, atmosphere and environment uh, in the 60s and the early 70s so that these Protestant fundamentalists and charismatic Pentecostal broadcasters were suddenly in their element because it took an entrepreneurial <laughs> sense of we've got to go out there, market our own programs, establish our own uh, sort of uh, rough-hewn networks, and we have to raise money from our listeners. And in that type of environment where they would end up paying to get airtime, they were masters at that by the 1970s. And so the electronic church had really become a thing, a, uh, something to uh, contend with and a major force within uh, American broadcasting. While all but eliminating free airtime for mainstream religious broadcast opened the door for entrepreneurial Pentecostal ministries, the proliferation of UHF, or ultra-high frequency television licenses, created space for Christian evangelism. 
Following World War II, the FCC allocated VHF, or very high frequency, to television broadcasting on channels 2 through 12. In Chicago, 2, 5, 7, 9, 11, and 12 served the commercial and public broadcast television markets. But with the rapid expansion of television as a popular form of entertainment, news, and commercial marketing, available frequencies soon became crowded and often interfered with each other. In response, the FCC expanded the number of broadcast licenses in the UHF bandwidth. Local markets like Chicago now had available frequencies 14 to 83. From a commercial standpoint, the new UHF channels were unsuccessful. TV set manufacturers often treated UHF tuners as optional. UHF also required an antenna that received the new UHF signals. As a result, UHF stations languished in obscurity as compared to the more popular VHF channels. Pentecostals, passionate about spreading the gospel, saw this as an opportunity. And hello there, ladies and gentlemen. This is Pat Robertson, your host on the 700 Club program. And we originated... And I was in UHF television in Dallas. We were trying to make UHF television working. I mean, we gave away thousands of, of rabbit ears in that little circle just so, you know, you can go to a 7-Eleven store, you could pick up, you know, get them for free because we're just trying to get people to watch. And many of those stations didn't make it. And that was the advent of Christian television because there were a lot of UHF stations that commercially fell flat on their face and they were available. Uh, Chicago Ferries for Labor, uh, they didn't fail. They just looked at it and said, this is not feasible. And here comes a bunch of Christians that said, hey, we'll take it. I was pastoring in Alton, Illinois. Had been there four years, but I had a burden for Chicago land and had uh, demographic studies of Chicago land on my desk in my study in Alton. And feeling that there would be a move, but I got a call from First Assembly in Denver and I said no on the telephone. Got a call to a church in New Jersey, a very fine church, said no. And then I got a call from Stone Church. Things just began to happen in my heart. Owen Carr was born in 1923 in Oklahoma. He became a pastor, an Assemblies of God pastor, at a pretty young age. Uh, he began in the ministry at, in 1942. He didn't have any uh, Bible college education, but he had a call of God on his life. Owen Carr pastored several churches in Kansas. In 1961, he was asked to come on staff at the national office to serve at the National Christ's Ambassadors Department, which was the youth department for the Assemblies of God. And then from there, he went back into the ministry again. So he was ahead of the curve, even when he was young in his ministry. By 1970, Owen Carr had moved to suburban Chicago and accepted a call to become the pastor of Stone Church. The Stone Church grew out of the Pentecostal or Azusa Street Revival that began in California in 1906. The revival spread to Chicago, where the congregation known as the Stone Church began. In 1914, Pentecostal churches formed a cooperative fellowship which eventually became the Christian denomination known today as the Assemblies of God. In 1968, Stone Church built a new building in suburban Palos Heights and became a focal point for a charismatic renewal that coincided with the social, radical, and political upheaval that was sweeping the nation. <laughs> 1968 began with the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. In April, civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated on the balcony of a Memphis hotel, followed shortly by the passage of the landmark Civil Rights Act. In June, Presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated, and in Chicago, Mayor Richard J. Daley hosted the Democratic National Convention while police and protesters battled in the parks and streets outside the International Amphitheater. We have no flag burners in this Democratic National Convention, and I don't think any of them would belong here. 
As violence, unrest, and acts of civil disobedience filled the headlines in Chicago and elsewhere, Stone Church had become a relatively established and mainstream Assemblies of God worshiping community. About this time, they began to attract new, younger converts who reflected, at least in appearance, the youth counterculture that was sweeping the nation. Although uncomfortable with new modes of dress and hairstyle, Owen Carr recognized the need to expand the reach of Stone Church beyond the walls of a single congregation and embrace an entire city. We came here from Alton, Illinois, and there we had a hippie revival with scores of hippies coming in. By the time we got here, they called them Jesus people uh, more than hippies. But it was the same group, just a different title, which was kind of hard for a state old church like this. They finally realized these are souls for whom Christ died, and we did not tell them how to dress. We just preached the gospel. The Stone Church, after its early heydays, when Owen Carr took the pastorate, they only had about 350 people at the church. But Owen Carr really has a vision. He always has a vision, it seems, and has just a wonderful, winsome spirit. And he was able, in his six years in the pastorate, to build it from 350 to 1,000 people in Sunday morning attendance. The Stone Church was not particularly predisposed to be the church that would do the television. They were a very good church, probably content with the way things were going. They had a great church. They had a great pastor. Everything was going well. I don't think that anybody had the vision to stretch that far by any chance. So I think it was a holy irony. I think it proves that God has a sense of humor. As Stone Church grew, so did Owen Carr's vision for spreading the gospel. December the 19th, I came the first Sunday in August, so we're just in a few weeks. I was in the family room of the parsonage, weeping over the city. God, you love them, and Jesus, you died for them, and Lord, I care, but I can't tell them. How can I tell this many people that God loves them? And it was like a thought passed through my head. A television station would help, but I knew nothing about television. I, I didn't even watch television. So I sat down to read, and my Bible fell open to Isaiah 54. And I read, Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. Well, when television came to America, we lived on the plains of Kansas, and there were no towers out there. There were no towers anywhere. So they went out on the prairie and put up a tower. And when it got up so far, they put out cables, and when it went higher, they put out longer cables. And when I read, lengthen your cords, in my mind, I saw those cables. And when I read, strengthen thy stakes, I saw those concrete abutments they anchored to. I wouldn't say it was a vision, but I wouldn't say it wasn't either. And I just stopped and I said, Lord, are you really trying to tell me something? As things began to percolate at Stone Church, the Chicago Federation of Labor, an umbrella organization representing a variety of local labor unions since the late 1800s, decided to sell its construction permit for a 5 million watt television UHF channel 38 WCFL TV with a transmitter on top of the brand new John Hancock building, then the second tallest building in the world. At the time, WCFL successfully owned and operated a popular all-hit music format AM radio station located in the iconic Marina Towers building, WCFL, featuring up-and-coming super jock Larry Lujak. Larry Lujak from Chicago at 329, pausing for station identification. Like other commercial efforts to make UHF television stations profitable, the Chicago Federation of Labor chose to sell its license and get out of the television business. They needed a buyer. Back at Stone Church, Owen Carr had privately become convinced that God was speaking to him about television. And so I called a board meeting. I just unburdened my heart for the city and told them what God had laid on my heart. But eventually somebody asked, what will it cost? And I had no idea. I said, I don't know, maybe $10 million. 
and with that being the only figure mentioned, they voted unanimously to try for it. With Owen Carr and Stone Church's vision in suburban Palos Heights, the economic profitability of ultra-high-frequency commercial television being called into question, and the Chicago Federation of Labor's decision to sell its planned TV station, and the actions of a Christian transmitter engineer working for a secular broadcaster in the John Hancock building, and his persistent efforts to identify and alert Christian groups of his discovery of an available TV license ultimately led to one of the most unlikely transactions in Chicago broadcast history. At that time, there were less than a thousand stations in the United States. Uh, people with experience were pretty limited. People that were Christians with experience were even more limited. And so there wasn't a very big pool to pull from. Dave Olslin was this incredible connection that we had with the entire city. And I think that maybe almost more than anyone else, Dave Olson's responsible for the early days of Channel 38. I had taken on a position here in Chicago in the John Hancock building. Around the corner from us, there was a new construction going on for a television station. It was um, going to be called WCFL, Channel 38. And I got to know the engineer who was uh, doing the contracting work up there. And he, he uh, told me about the station, and they're going ahead. Uh, but however, they're probably not going to be putting it on the air. Giving me some inside information that the WCFL, the management, was extremely worried because some of the other U's were not financially making it at that time. And he says they're probably just going to sell the construction permit. I began contacting some other individuals about the possibility of a Christian television station, not knowing that any existed. Well, it's morning clock time here on WMBI or WMBI-FM in Chicago. My first suggestion was to Moody Bible Institute. At one time, their former president said they were interested in going into a television ministry. And so I contacted Bob Neff, who was the vice president of the broadcasting at that time. And I left word with the secretary at first, and heard nothing back. And I contacted him again, and, uh, and they said, no, they're not necessarily interested at this time. I then mentioned it to a manager of WYCA in Hammond, Indiana. He attended Stone Church and happened to mention to Owen Carr that this station may be coming available. I received the call and he introduced himself on the phone in the control room at Channel 26. And he said, hey, well, well, tell me about this uh, station that's going to be on the block. Da, 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 da. I told him. Armed with inside knowledge that a TV station was available in Chicago, Carr swore his staff and church board to secrecy regarding the vision and set out to develop a marketing campaign and set a date for announcing the idea to the congregation and wider community with fanfare, literally. The most exciting thing that's ever happened in the Stone Church and its history will happen on September the 30th on Sunday morning. We started that weeks ahead and uh, we unveiled what was called the city with no doors. There were about 700 people packed in. We had a trumpet trio prepared to blow a fanfare and so they blew the fanfare and we pulled back the velvet and uncovered the picture and I started presenting it. So we had offering envelopes stacked uh, quite a number each way, just crisscrossed, and the board was trained to go down the aisle and just lay a bunch of these at the end of each aisle. And we had a couple of the deacons on the platform. We had an adding machine up there. They would check these to be sure they were valid before they gave them to me to read. And the trumpet trio was to blow a fanfare at every 10,000. Well, we had 10,000 almost immediately. and. 20,000 and 30,000 and they, I don't think we heard two fanfares in the whole thing. They just got caught up in it. When we said 60,000, some lady said, you must be kidding. But we weren't. 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 20, 130, $135,000 in that offering. 
Stone Church was mainly interested in television because of Owen Carr. I don't think, frankly, it entered their mind until Owen came up with this idea and presented it to the board, and they found out about the availability of Channel 38. Owen Carr got the ball rolling. With seed money in hand and his church behind him, Carr's next move was to hire a recent Wheaton College graduate to work on publicity. Like Carr, Steve Warner knew next to nothing about television. He didn't tell me at that moment what he had in mind. In fact, he did not tell me for 15 months after that. Two weeks away from graduation, he said to me, I need to tell you a story, come into my office. And that's when he broke the news that they were going to start a TV station within a short amount of time, and he wanted me to be the first person to work with it. And I said, we need to find out what other people are doing. We can't reinvent the typewriter. But first of all, we frankly don't know what the typewriter is, so we can't reinvent it anyway. I booked a flight to Dallas, and I was going to go visit the Christian television stations there. When I got to Dallas, I had, I think, 15 minutes with the president of that station, which was the flagship station, I think, for Pat Robertson's operation. I don't even know what questions to ask, frankly. So I mushered into the office of Jerry Rose. I, I only knew his name. And we got to talking, and I don't know how it was, but somehow we hit it off. We just kind of hit it off, and I said, hey, you know, instead of us staying at a hotel, why don't you just come? I'd like to talk to you more. So we probably talked to 1 o'clock in the morning. And when I came back and I wrote up my report, I remember I had this one line in there. Of all the things I found out on this trip, I found this one thing, that, that we've got a good manager down there in Dallas, and he needs to be hired. So we invited Jerry to come meet with the board. One of the board members took him up uh, to the observation deck of the Hancock Center, looking out on the lake with the sailboats out there, and Jerry was into sailing, and that's what he talked about. Didn't talk about the city, didn't talk about the potential, didn't talk about television, it just the sailing. And he said he wasn't interested. Owen knew absolutely zero about television. There was not one man on that board of directors who knew anything about television, nothing. They didn't have any money, they didn't have any knowledge. Uh, all they had was the possibility of this incredible antenna owned by the Chicago Federation of Labor sitting up there. I'll never forget, they interviewed me, and then one of the board members said, Jerry, it's only fair to tell you, we don't have any money. We could be bankrupt in a month. So he went home and uh, told Shirley said they don't have any organization, they don't have any equipment, they don't have any money, they don't have any backing, they don't have anything. I'm not interested. But she felt an inkling toward Chicago. I remember when we went to Chicago to interview, it was cold, it was windy, it was gray, the people talked funny, and we couldn't imagine living there. We knew that nothing was guaranteed, even Jerry's salary was not guaranteed. But we had already determined that God was calling us there. In the Chicago area and this entire region was one of the last uh, areas in the country to be reached by extensive cable television networks. In the rest of the country, a lot of the feeds from some of these broadcast networks like CBN and then later Trinity Broadcasting out on the West Coast were reaching, you know, into homes throughout the South and the Southwest and the rural Midwest. In the Chicago area, unless you had access to a broadcast station, um, you were in uh, trouble. It was uh, going to be a difficult market to penetrate. Other ministries had, had the opportunity to have a TV station here, and they had reached a point of impossibility, and they walked away. Owen didn't have walk away. I mean, he didn't, he didn't have the capacity to walk away. Uh, he just kept believing God. I'm not sure that I would have had that kind of faith. Months passed, and I finally started praying, God, I need Jerry Rose. Would you send Jerry Rose? because I need somebody that knows Christian television, so send Jerry Rose, and I just prayed specifically. Rejecting Owen Carr's offer to come to Chicago, Rose returned to Dallas and accepted a position in Virginia Beach, Virginia, with Pat Robertson's Christian Broadcasting Network. Chicago, however, was still on the mind of Jerry Rose. And the Lord just was speaking to our heart, and I called him and I said, have you found anybody? And he said, uh, no, I have not. 
And uh, so I said, well, I'll, uh, you know, I'll keep thinking. We hung up. About five minutes later, he called me back. He said, is God saying something to you? And I said, you know what? Maybe he is. By the summer of 1974, a new not-for-profit corporation, Christian Communications of Chicagoland, was formed. A makeshift office was set up at Stone Church and Carr, the board, and its new vice president and general manager, Jerry Rose, launched into an exhaustive marketing and fundraising campaign, which culminated in the First National Bank of Evergreen Park, extending a $600,000 letter of credit. Combining the credit with donations from Stone Church and others, Carr and Rose made a non-redeemable cash offer of $25,000 in earnest money to purchase the transmitter and construction permit from the Chicago Federation of Labor for $850,000, millions of dollars less than the CFL's original asking price. While we were negotiating, their attorney had one problem. When he was really under pressure, his ears would get red. So I knew when I had him under pressure. <laughs> Now we go from a station that was worth maybe $4 million down to $2 million, and dynamically the same thing happened in terms of the sale as happens when a person has a house, they've got to liquidate and get out of there. The price kept going down. So God worked a miracle backwards. He didn't give us a lot more money. He just made it a lot less money we had to spend. So I reached a point where I said, I know $25,000 isn't a lot of money for you fellows, but it's a lot of money for us. And I laid the check on the desk and I said, uh, we would like to sign a contract on that, and uh, if I don't come up with the rest of it, we'll forfeit the 25000 They huddled, they said, Reverend, you'd have to come up with at least another, and I was thinking, million, two million. He said, $150,000. I said, well, I have some men on standby. I'll place a conference call. And I called, and the treasurer said, I don't even have to pray about it, just sign the paper. We walked out of there and Jerry and I went downstairs and he said, well, we bought it. Now what are we going to do? <laughs> the clock began ticking. Now the proud owners of a transmitter and a construction permit for a 5 million watt UHF television station that covered Chicago, its suburbs, and as far east as Holland, Michigan, north to Milwaukee, and south to Peoria, Illinois, Christian Communications of Chicagoland had six months to raise an additional $400,000 above their $600,000 existing line of credit from their bank before the FCC would actually grant them a license. Having a channel without a license is equivalent to having a car without a license. You can't drive it. I think it was about a week or so before the entire agreement uh, with the uh, Chicago Chicago Federation of Labor would expire and we didn't have the money. And I was calling programmers all over the country and saying, you know, could you, could we sign a contract with us that if this comes together that you'll purchase a contract. I had a number of them who said, yeah, we'll do that if you get on the air. So I fly to Washington and, and I've got a stack of little pieces of paper. Mrs. Jones from Palos Park says that if we get on the air, she will pledge $5,000 uh, this family says that they would pledge 2000 This family, and I felt like an idiot. I package all this up and I, I give it to them and they said, look, we'll look at it, we'll let you know. The next two days, I just walked around Washington, D.C. I, I didn't expect to be there that long. I think I had one suit. I expected to be there a day and go home, and it was like three days. And I'm praying and I'm saying, God, you know, I don't, you know please, what's, what's happening? On the last day, I go to Mark Burfield's office, and I walk in, and uh, I said, have we heard anything? And he just kind of stares at me a minute, and he hands me this little note. It, it said, Chicago has been granted. Defying conventional wisdom, Christian Communications of Chicagoland had achieved the impossible, a transmitter and license to broadcast in the third largest television market in America, with that market's most powerful transmission signal. The fact that Channel 38 in Chicago ever existed was 
kind of an amazing <laughs> uh, development because, you know, originally the license had been meant for Chicago Federation of Labor, the television license, and uh, Owen Carr comes along and is able to get his hands on that license and uh, come up with enough money to, to make that fly. What remained was perhaps the biggest hurdle of all, lights, cameras, and a studio connected to the transmitter. In the mid-1970s, television production and post-production was expensive, really expensive. The 2850 represents probably the most advanced achievement in VTR design to date. Studio cameras could run in the tens of thousands of dollars. Electronic switching equipment, audio, lights, and editing could run into the millions. All this expensive capital infrastructure needed to be housed in a studio embedded with miles of cable. As results-oriented Pentecostals, Carr and Rose turned for help to the largest Christian organization in the world, the Roman Catholic Church. In 1975, John Patrick Cardinal Cody was the leader of the Chicago Archdiocese, the largest Roman Catholic Archdiocese in the United States. A staunch conservative, Cody's critics accused him of disregarding the Second Vatican Council's reforms, including wider opinions in decision-making within the Church and broader ecumenical reforms calling for a restoration of unity among all Christians. Not only was Chicago the largest Catholic archdiocese in 1975, it also owned and operated the largest parochial school system in the country. In an effort to connect this vast community, Cody created a multi-million dollar super high frequency closed circuit satellite television network originating at a state-of-the-art two million dollar recording studio located at 1 North Wacker Drive. The studio had been built four and a half years earlier by RCA as a sound recording studio and then subleased to the Archdiocese in 1973. They tell you when you have to be on the air. The FCC gives you so much time. And we, uh, the Catholic television, they had a Catholic closed circuit television. It was beamed from the top of the Sears Tower out to their schools, and they had dishes on the schools to pick it up. And only there could you get it. You couldn't get it broadcast. And they had beautiful studios, and so we arranged to use their studios. The week before we were to go on the air, the Cardinal found out that we were doing that and he canceled it. And they wouldn't even talk to us after that. They wouldn't take the phone. So we were looking for some place. On May 26, 1975, Christian Communications of Chicagoland received the call letters WCFC, winning Chicagoland for Christ. Five days later, Memorial Day, TV 38 was scheduled to go live on the air, except now they had no studio, no crew, no equipment, and no way to get the live signal up to the John Hancock and out through the transmitter. We were trying to sign on the air by the next Monday, and Owen said, you know, we'll be there, we'll be on the air. And I said, well, I don't know how. I said, the only thing I know is I can run the tape through your teeth and they can watch it in your eyes, because that's all I've got. Friday, before we were to go on the air on Monday, a couple of guys came to my office and said, we hear you're looking for studios. Yes, we are. Well, we have studios. Well, that was a misnomer, really. They had a warehouse with a black curtain stretched around the corner and some dilapidated equipment. In one frantic weekend, the team, that now included transmitter engineers Lex Young and Dave Osland, convinced the owners of Olympic Studios on Chicago's near west side to throw together a live production which included the last minute purchase of a time-based corrector and the miraculous discovery of a live cable feed from the studios to at and Central Switching Center and then up to the transmitter on the John Hancock building. So we had invited uh, the banker and his staff and their companions and people from Stone Church and we'd signed up some prayer counselors and we invited them and their companions and there were about a hundred and twenty five people pouring in there and these guys had worked all day and all night I mean Friday Saturday Sunday and into Monday and they're exhausted and mad 
and cussing. That night could only be described as mayhem. Nothing was working out like we had thought. We had telephone counselors there, but they had no place to sit. Time is running out. People running around like chickens with their head cut off. And all of a sudden, a man comes over, grabs me by the shoulders, propels me across the floor and said, you stand right there. He came back with a big microphone, put it in my hand. And I said, what do I do with this? So he was trying to turn his Bible and, and use a handheld mic. And he went over by the camera, turned around, the red light came on, and he said, you're on the air. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now in Chicago, we have Channel 38, a Christian television station. We were feeling exhilarated, but I said, now, Owen, the work starts. Now we've got to program it. Now we have to make it happen day after day after day after day. WCFC TV 38 went on the air May 31, 1976 at the Olympic Studios on Chicago's near west side with a limited primetime broadcast schedule of five hours a day. In an interview with the Chicago Tribune, Owen Carr, who had by now resigned his pastorate at the Stone Church to devote himself full-time to TV 38, confessed that TV 38 needed income of at least $3,000 a day for 50 hours of broadcasting a week. I thought all God wanted me to do was get the station on the air and I would get it on the air and maybe we'd have a program on the station, but I wasn't to be involved. The Lord spoke to my heart and that's the first time I knew I had to leave the church. For more than a year, the fledgling station filled its program schedule with a flagship talk and music program titled Chicago, featuring Owen Carr, Thurman Faison, and Jerry Rose a traditional preaching program with Stone Church titled Living Stones, a scripture reading program, an animated children's program produced by the Lutheran Church in America titled Davy and Goliath, and Rally, a local remote program. The station also began running paid, nationally syndicated Christian programs like the PTL Club with Jim and Tammy Baker, Day of Discovery, and Pat Robertson's 700 Club. While paid, nationally syndicated programming filled airtime and helped pay the bills, original, locally produced programs began to define TV 38 in Chicago. After surviving a year in the antiquated Olympic studios, TV 38 signed a deal to rent a tiny 25 by 25 foot penthouse studio that once housed ABC in Chicago, located on the 44th floor of the Kemper Building at 20 North Wacker Drive. 20 North Wacker, the, the Civic Opera Building, is such a beautiful, historic building. It was really an uptown address. It was, it was very classy. But we had a tiny studio on top of the building. You had to take two different elevators to get to it, and one was kind of rickety. I was not content with just having sole programs, just having programmers on this station. I wanted this to become local, to reach our community, to be a part of the community. I wanted us to have content. On the one hand, we didn't have money to do the content, but we didn't, we didn't know we couldn't do it. God can make it happen. In the 1970s, television production jobs were limited to a handful of film and video production companies, and the three major broadcast networks, PBS, and a few independent television stations like WGN. Jobs in the broadcast television industry were often ranked based on market size. A young person seeking a career in television production would typically start in a small television market and work their way up to New York, Los Angeles, or Chicago. When TV38 began broadcasting in the third largest market in the nation, aspiring television production and creative producers with a Christian background were attracted. Low pay, limited budgets, and long hours were a small price to pay with a chance to get a break in a major market. Larry, uh, you come to us from uh, a quite well-known university. Uh, tell us about it. 
Uh, I just graduated about oh, approximately two, two and a half months ago from Oral Roberts University. I graduated in May of 76, and Channel 38 was due to come on the air at the end of the month. We started out small, but eventually, you know, we, we grew, and we had great production team. The 35 fourth floor was always a buzz in place. We had musicians, we had hosts, we had telephone counselors coming and going every day. And we had telethons, live telethons on opening night in the new studio that we opened up on the 44th floor. Dave Wills and I went and picked up two used cameras that were given to the station, and one of the cameras worked. So we had one camera for the whole night. We would shoot the main talent, we would go to black, and then we would shoot the music talent, and we'd go back and forth. This is WCFC TV 38 Chicago. WCFC uh, stood for Winning Chicago Land for Christ. When I went up for the job interview, Owen, who was president, Jerry Rose, and Ray McKellip, who was production manager at the time, had a very clear vision. In a year, we want to be the largest producer of local programming in Chicago. And we want to do programs that hit every aspect of life. I didn't want to do a sermon, a prayer, and a song. I wanted to do things that were creative. And what they told me is that if we offer you this job uh, as a producer director, any idea you have that you can figure out to do with no money and few props and little equipment that you've wanted to do that's of Christian ministry in nature that will touch people, you can do. I think all of us, the young staff, said, hey, what do we watch? So we started developing a lot of unique programming, I think, that wasn't being done elsewhere. We started doing something that was completely different. We basically had two programs that we produced locally. God's Word for Today, the Chicago program, which was 90 minutes live at night. We went from that to 16 weekly series, plus a live daily program within about six months' time. We did that with one studio, two old cameras, one remote truck, and a, a mini cam, quote unquote. Um, <laughs> Never had there been an opportunity like that on you know secular TV. You'd have, oh, maybe a Sunday show here and there, and it was boring and horrible, and it's only because the TV stations knew they had to do it to fulfill FCC licensing requirements of local programming. But this was a whole new thing, and you could come up with fun things. So TV wasn't just you had to sit there and cry your eyes out and say how oh, Jesus loved you. You could actually have fun and learn things in a creative way. We tried to do that a little bit. I started out there doing air switching and doing live audio. And the live audio was I was basically faking what I was doing. I kind of knew what I was doing, but I didn't really know. You know what I mean? And this studio was just nothing. It was a room that had chicken wire on the wall, they had a control room that was in shambles and stuff like that. So they basically rebuilt that. On one side over here you had a, a set, and the other side over here you had music, and over here you had counselors, and it was just, it was crazy how they did it. I started out working with two-inch tape, and if you know anything about two-inch tape, you know that it was somewhat antiquated at the time. It was very problematic. The machines were, oh my gosh, I, 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 think, I think Thomas Edison invented, I'm not sure. To do the air switching, we essentially had two machines, one of which worked all the time. It very seldom both of them work. So you basically, on a Sunday afternoon, you had to pre-cue all the tapes and, and set them on the floor. And the brakes in this thing were not like you see today. They were, they were basically a film chain. And a film chain is basically, you had two slide projectors and a 60 millimeter projector. And you, and you had a mirror that changed everything. So we had slides. You pick up the tapes, you put them on the machine, and you had them pre queued and you put the button, and it was a 10 second roll, and you had to get it just right. Most of the time you did. But that was a Sunday afternoon. And that was just fun. We hired this one girl, and quitting time came, and people just kept working. She put on her coat and left. Second night, she put on her coat and left. Third night, she put on her coat and looked around and said, doesn't anybody ever leave here? <laughs> it's a year out of school. I've been working at a photo shop in St. Louis. Really want to get more into the art direction side of it. Heard about the 38 job and, well, I called. Got through to Barb Dahl. She said, oh, I'll put you right through to Jerry. Talked to Jerry Rose. I said, uh, we, we, we want you, we want you, we want you on board. Literally, just a 10-second phone call changed my life from right there. 
Art director was responsible for all of the print media that had to be produced for any TV station, newsletters, promotions, flyers. He also had to design all the scenic designs for any productions that were going to be done in-house. So we came up with this idea for a game show. That's always exciting and a lot of us in Christian circles were grew up with uh, Bible quizzes and so. And after the first season, they said, uh, Don, we want you to produce it. Dave did, wanted to get rid of it and try something new. Initially, the thing was called Bible Scrabble, and, uh, and that was good for the concept we had in mind. However, we started airing the thing, <laughs> and we quickly were threatened with a suit if we didn't uh, cease and desist. We came up with the uh, name Baffle, changed it to that, and, and worked it from there. Now that thing took off, and of course it won an Emmy originally. Oh yes, you came back and we're still here. Gang, let's go on to round number two. We've taken all of your scores back to zero, and remember the first question is worth 100 points, and each question increases in value by 100 points after the first one. Here it is. Who was Moses' brother? Dwight? Uh, Aaron. Aaron is correct as the desk falls apart. <laughs> he keeps beating me to the uh, buzzer there. Right? Uh, to tie his hands down, I think. I'm expecting to see Dwight pull a 12-pound maul out of his back pocket. <laughs> it was a totally unique sort of a program. Sanctified entertainment. I mean, a Christian game show? Can there be such a thing? And here's what you're going to win. Tommy, tell us what we are going to work for this time. Mike, if you win, you will receive admission for two at Biblical Gardens in the Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. Well, we can do a game show. Little tongue-in-cheek. We had our prizes, but they were kind of ridiculous. But we presented them as if they were getting a brand new car. There's prizes for you if you can do that, and here they are. Tommy? Mike, you will receive a wooden table tray set from Quaker Industries of Antioch, Illinois. This fine addition to your home will prevent any future damage to your furniture or lap by providing a stable and... A Quaker TV table, wow. That must cost like $25 retail, if, if, and that might be a lot. We were doing Bible Baffle, and I was, had gone to this record company. We were producing some stuff, a recording studio. And so I'm standing there, and a guy comes to me, almost apologetic, and he said, uh, uh, Steve Dahl, he's a fan of yours. <laughs> Steve would like to talk to you. Steve Dahl, at the time, was the hottest thing in Chicago. Uh, he was a shock jock. He was very controversial. Steve Dahl said, would you let me host Bible Baffle? <laughs> I went to Evangel College in Springfield, Missouri. One of my uh, dorm mates was Norm Mintel. And Norm Mintel had taken a position at uh, TV 38. Norm told Ray McKillop, who was also an Evangel graduate, that you should talk to this guy, Dan Wheeler, because I had nine months of TV experience at an ABC affiliate in Springfield as an on-air sportscaster. I flew up for an interview. Ray McKillop took me all around the city of Chicago and showed me the lights and the buildings. And I was in Namburn. And I kept saying, when are we going to see the studio? <laughs> and finally, at the end, he showed me the studio. And I was amazed it was so tiny. It was like the size of a two-car garage. And I said, where's your other studio? He said, this is it. Then on the flight on the way back to Springfield, I read a book called The Battle is the Lord's by Owen Carr. And after reading that book, I was convinced that God had called me to come to Chicago and to TV 38. I learned to run camera. I learned to run the audio board. I learned how to edit, how to do some directing, how to do lighting. It was amazing. It was like my learning curve was straight up and it was a wonderland for someone who wanted to go into TV production because it was non-union, you could do anything. And we did, from building sets to doing on-air work, I was able to do it all. And what I loved about TV 38 is when I became a producer, I could have an idea and put it on the air. I didn't have to go through a committee, I didn't have to write a proposal or a treatment. It was just have the idea, do it, and put it on the air. It was wonderful. In a 1960 appearance on NBC's Meet the Press, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. famously pointed out that 11 o'clock Sunday morning was the most segregated hour in America. When TV 38 began broadcasting in the 1970s, not much had changed. 
especially in Chicago, where memories of race riots in the 1960s were still fresh. From its outset, Owen Carr's vision for TV38 was focused on reaching the city. According to the 1980 census, Cook County, Illinois had a population of 5.3 million. 1.3 million were African American. Chicago was also known as the gospel capital of the world. Leading Chicago pastors like the Reverend R.D. Henton from Monument of Faith Evangelistic Church and the Reverend Clay Evans from Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church quickly recognized the potential of a 24-hour-a-day broadcast Christian television station in the Chicago market. You in the right place at the right time. Thanks be unto God. Good singing, good preaching, and good prayer. It works, it works. So I thought that when Channel 38 came to down the religious station, I, I applied right away and asked for some time. And it worked. Everybody on your feet. The relationship between WCFC TV38 and Chicago's African American community was symbiotic. African American pastors had access to TV38's 50,000 watt transmitter, TV38 had a built in audience, and perhaps most influential, TV38 had access to a pipeline of talented, eager African American television production personnel who cut their teeth working on local productions and moved seamlessly over to TV38, where they honed their craft and ultimately went on to work for Oprah Winfrey's Harpo Productions, WGN, WTTW, and other broadcast network news and sports production units. Reverend Hatton opened up the door. So many black cameramen, engineers, editors, that even went on to work for Harpo Studios, came out of Monument. And Monument was on TV 38. I mean, you could not separate what was going on in the black church and broadcasting from TV 38. As TV 38's connection with the African American community grew, Dave Oslin, now the station's program director, saw potential in gathering Chicago's vast gospel music talent pool into a weekly broadcast production known as Saturday Night Sing. Back then, there wasn't a lot of, uh, on, especially on television, of, of black music. Uh, uh, unless you went to church you re or listened to the radio, you just didn't hear a lot of gospel music. Saturday Night Sing with Taff Harris uh, as the host gave a platform for people all over the country, from choirs to individual singers, and they came from far and near. For the first time on Saturday Night Sing, we are delighted to present to you now Dr. Charles G. Hayes and the Cosmopolitan Church of Prayer Choir. Saturday Night Sing did a lot for us and as a community. Uh, everybody loves good music and we love the music that comes out of the black church. And initially we didn't have the studio facilities for this. And so uh, uh, I contacted uh, Reverend Evans at Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church, better known as The Ship, as well as Monument of Faith Church. And they allowed us to come in every other month in each church and use their facilities and their cameras and their people. Saturday Night Sing was one of the uh, programs that actually got me introduced to TV 38. When that show started, they were going on location and we developed strong relationship and they saw some of the skill and talent that we had at Monument of Faith. Uh, we had our own equipment. Uh, we were pretty lily white and what this did, it acquainted us with some wonderful people and boy did we get some 
terrific individuals that uh, then became part of our staff. So they invited us to actually come to TV 38. At that time, they were at 20 North Wacker, and they had a telethon going on. And so they asked us to come in and see if we wanted to work camera and actually gave me a chance uh, to actually work camera for one of their telethons. While TV 38 opened the door for African Americans, the station also served as a launch pad for a host of other young professionals who experienced success at TV 38 and then went on to successful careers in a wide range of professions. I was already a writer and um, was learning all TV production because when you are in a non-union station, you're not limited by what you're able to do. And so I pretty much was able to, you know, do the interviewing, write the scripts, um, set up the programs, you know, be part of the production team, but also work very closely with the crew. And so from that standpoint, it was a huge opportunity. It was probably better than getting a PhD. I loved coming in to Channel 38 over the years because it was a challenge to me. Television and some coaching along the way helped to bring a little bit of demonstration, I don't know, uh, gestures and so on out of me. And I needed that, and I'm grateful for it. Everybody that came through here, I mean, we started a lot of young people in television, but there was no other place in Chicago that they could have gone and had the opportunity to do the kind of television with our telethons. I mean, our telethons were wild. When a guy learned to direct one of our telethons, uh, he was a master director because it was it was keep up and chase. I could see uh, Christian stations in other communities and could see how different Channel 38 was from most of the local Christian stations I would observe. But they think that everybody is into faith healing or tongue speaking uh, and, and that sort of thing, which which is fine for some people, but uh, that's not what every Christian is all about. But that's not all that ele the electric church is. Uh, I, I, it, by the same token, I don't think you can so narrowly define what the electric church would be. Of course, there Cyril Roberts. Uh, at the same time, there's James Robinson. At the same time, there's Robert Schuler. At the same time, uh, there was uh, uh, Bishop Sheen. Uh, at the same, you, there has is and has been. Uh, really quite a cross-section. You've had everything from, you know, well, you've had, you've had a cross-section of what the church is all about that has been, has been showcased, in a sense, on television. I, I think I would res respectfully disagree with that. I, I don't think it's been uh, a broad cross-section. I understand that Bob Shuler is not Jerry Falwell. There's no question about that. Uh, but I think that uh, television has been used basically by conservative evangelicals, uh, of which I am one, and by fundamentalists. And, um, and it hasn't been used by the mainstream now. I'm not blaming you for that. It's mm -hmm. not your fault. Uh, but the point is, there is a great body of believers out there who may be watching this station and may be, in fact, appreciating and growing from Christian television, but that's not really where they're coming from. Channel 38 was a place where Christians of many varieties would be welcomed, their views would be respected. I think that is a highly Christian and evolved attitude, and pretty rare during those times. 24 hour a day, Christian TV for Chicagoland. This is WCFC TV 38. When TV 38 went on the air in 1976, another Chicago Protestant Evangelical Broadcast Ministry was, by then, in its 51st year. WMBI, the flagship radio station of the Moody Bible Institute, had developed a potential audience of 30 million listeners. Old biases held by many Pentecostal and non-Pentecostal Evangelicals resulted in a sense of mistrust when it came to formal cooperation. Pentecostals like Owen Carr and Jerry Rose were seen as being too flamboyant, practicing biblical gifts of the Spirit such as speaking in tongues, healing, and divine words of knowledge. More theologically conservative evangelicals, typified by the Moody Bible Institute, were seen by Pentecostals as missing out on the full gospel experience. What seemed like a natural partnership on the surface was, in reality, a deep 
ecclesiastical divide. One of the strange aspects of this story is that Chicago had long been home to a tradition of uh, evangelical broadcasting. Contact between uh, Moody Radio and uh, Channel 38 was limited at best because the old theological divide between the solid fundamentalist movement that Moody represented coming back to the 1920s and earlier, and the Pentecostals were on different sides of the theological ledger. And I think there was a definite sense on the Moody side that uh, to dabble with these people, to have contact or cooperation with them, would really upset a large number of people in their constituency. So it was almost to their advantage to not have anything to do with Channel 38. One Baptist lady said, you know what, TV 38, let us learn that Pentecostals are not of the devil. If these folk are of the devil, how come Owen weeps over lost souls? Would the devil be doing that? And if they're of the devil, how come they promote Jesus so much? Would the devil be doing that? <laughs> It took some time for Moody to begin to see that we really were meaningful in the marketplace. And I can understand it. They had taken a very strong position on the Pentecostal charismatic issue. They were pretty stuck with that. But Dr. Sweeting and I had a meeting, and he said, I know you're Pentecostal. He said, how Pentecostal are you going to be? And I said, that's my question for you. How Pentecostal are we going to be? Because if you work with us, we will be less Pentecostal. But if you don't, by default, I'll be more Pentecostal. So, Dr. Sweeting, how Pentecostal am I going to be? It got pretty hot. <laughs> Sweeting said, you promote the Pentecostal witness, but uh, you don't uh, tell us about the other. I said, oh, yeah, we, we promote the evangelicals. And uh, he wanted to know about how many non-Pentecostals we had on our board. I said, well, how many Pentecostals do you have on your board? And I mean, it just went back and forth like this for one hour. For about four years, we had practically no relationship with Moody. And one day I got another call from Dr. Sweeting. Dr. Sweeting said, you know, my friends tell me that they listen to Moody and watch TV 38. And I said, yeah, that I would say that that is very true. Uh, they believe in the validity of both of us. And he said, yes, they do. And he said, you know, the thing I've discovered is that we're probably together on 95% of our doctrine. I said, we are. We are. And I said, but that 5% is very important to your constituency and to your board of trustees, so I understand your problem. I said, but maybe there's ways that we can start very small and just start working together. By February 1984, Owen Carr had taken a job as president of Valley Forge Christian College in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, and handed over the reins of leadership to Jerry Rose. Still in their rented two-car garage on the 44th floor of the Civic Opera Building, TV 38 needed more space. Ironically, the Chicago Archdiocese Catholic Television Network facilities across the street at 1 North Wacker Drive had become available. This was the same organization that had denied the fledgling TV 38 its first studios days before they were to have gone on the air in 1976. The Archdiocese of Chicago's 10-year experiment with TV production is over. The church will keep its closed circuit system linking parishes throughout the city, but it has agreed to sell all of its production equipment to Channel 38. The CTN facilities featured three large studios, office space, and a construction shop. When TV 38 moved across the street, they instantly became a Christian television production machine, cranking out a series of creative, original, local programs. I kind of had a desire to entertain inform and inspire. That was my formula. And I created a magazine show called A Closer Look and we would open with just an entertaining story about Chicago which was so much fun. We would go around with the crew and uh, interview really interesting people and, and do stories, some of which 
would never have aired on the major networks in town. Then the second stories would often be more educational. And then third, we would always leave people with a, a real upbeat story that would inspire them and oftentimes trying to inspire them in their faith. For my part, TV38 served as a mind and spirit expanding postgraduate school where I learned to run studio camera, build sets, light, floor direct, technical direct, and even direct live programs. I also spent several years on a minicam crew, recording stories around Chicago using a technique known as electronic field production, smaller ENG cameras, videotape decks, lights, and microphones were loaded into an aging station wagon and then driven all over the city and beyond recording stories for various TV38 programs. This meant coverage of the tumultuous 1980s local and national political scene, including interviews with Chicago Mayor Harold Washington, campaign stops with Presidents Reagan and H.W. Bush, and former NFL star Congressman Jack Kemp. TV38 also gave me the opportunity to produce my own self-funded documentary with my spouse, Julie Frakes, on life in a rural hospital in the Central African nation of Zaire. November 25th, 1987, we were recording the lighting of the Salvation Army Christmas tree near Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago when we learned that Mayor Harold Washington had suffered a heart attack. This sad day for Chicago was an opportunity for me to cover a breaking national news story. On June 13, 1986, 11 years after the Vietnam War ended, Clark Gray and I covered a parade honoring American veterans of that conflict. At the time, Americans were still coming to grips with the Vietnam legacy, and public displays of patriotism were rare and not particularly fashionable. The route started in Olive Park in the South Loop and ended in Grant Park. Organizers expected 125,000 marchers, an estimated 200,000 actually participated, cheered by an estimated 500,000 spectators. Clark and I boarded a CTA bus loaded with disabled vets, and the driver let us climb through the hatch and record from the roof of the bus. We also covered pro athletes at Wrigley Field, Comiskey Park, and Chicago Stadium. In addition, we covered a wide range of stories and events impacting the local Christian community that introduced me to Roman Catholic, Orthodox, African American, and mainline Protestant faith communities. Father Nikitas is the Chancellor of the Greek Orthodox Church here in Chicago. Eventually, Dave Oslin tapped me on the shoulder to develop and produce a weekly half-hour news magazine program titled Page Two. This meant building a set, complete with a fake live news feed monitor where Dave Oslin or Debbie Revitzer would read copy from a teleprompter introducing stories we produced in the field. As always, resources were tight, and I only had access to the minicam crew for a day and a half a week. This gave me 12 hours to acquire enough content to fill a half-hour program. No easy task. Perhaps TV38's most ambitious and creative effort was a weekly children's program, Toddler's Friends. It all began out of a relationship that we had with Stone Church right. in Palos Heights. We were hired by Owen Carr to be the children's pastor. It was in 1980 that Jerry Rose approached us about going on staff at TV38. So he wanted us not only to produce a program, but to build a ministry around it that could somehow influence Chicagoland. There were other children's ministries television programs, but they were geared towards the elementary age. And we've always felt that you begin as young as possible. And so we wanted to include that preschool age, and it really paid off. Toddler's Friends was about uh, a couple named Ed and Sonia Toddler, who had been big city people, who had decided that uh, they were going to move to the country. And so they left, as the song says, the hustle and the bustle of the city, and they moved out to the country, and they uh, took ownership of a country store. 
out of that, uh, neighbors would come in, like the, the infamous uh, Homer Mott, the local farmer, played by Rod Sell, would come in and do commerce with us. And, and, and he always had some kind of issue that Ed and Sonia, the voices of reason, had to deal with. You, you won't believe what happened. Well, well what's yeah. wrong with my you, tractor, Homer? My tractor, it's right in the middle of the plowing season, right? You see me out plowing my fields? Right. Well, I didn't even get started. I went in to get my tractor out of the barn. It's still sitting there. It won't go. Well, well settle down, sit down, sit down. Sit down, well, how can I sit down? We had a clown character. Buttons the Clown moved onto our property as sort of a place where he could land when he wasn't out doing shows. Just hang on to him real tight. Yeah, right? And a quarter. Yeah, a quarter. A quarter I'll, a I'll be right back. A quarter piece. We got a quarter piece and we got all these. We got the yellow ones and the pink ones and the green. I wonder if I got a quarter. It's a, I don't have one over there. Maybe I got one over here in this hand. I'm going to look over here in this. I don't have a quarter there. And maybe, maybe, maybe. I thought for sure. I thought for sure I had a quarter here, down in here. No, I see it was. I know I had a quarter somewhere, and I just. I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and get one. Which, I don't have a, I can't find. I can't find my quarter. Where's I, my balloons? When it comes to Christian children's okay. ministry, Where'd I have never balloons? been excited what about clowns. Just, when this was introduced to me, you know, my guards went up. I thought, nah, a clown on the program. How's this gonna work? But little did I know that Leon McBride was one of the top clowns in the world. We yeah. built the show around his skit because it was that good. Yeah. So uh, he was an absolute pro. To work with a guy like that was uh, way beyond our league. Probably one of the highlights of the show was we would sit around the, uh, the pot-bellied stove at some point and we would open up a Bible storybook. There would be a shot of a watercolor drawing in the book as I began to tell the story, and that would then uh, dissolve into live action uh, puppetry. Okay, men, throw him overboard. So the men picked up Jonah and threw him overboard into the sea, and immediately the storm stopped. As soon as Jonah hit the water, he began to swim for his life. During the time we were in South Africa, there was a time we were making a 1,000 mile trip from Johannesburg to Cape Town in a car. And we had a young missionary associate with us. And uh, she said, Ed, you know, you've been in the ministry <laughs> near 40 years. He said, what was the best time you ever had in the ministry? I said, the most fun time I ever had in the ministry is when we were producing Toddler's Friends at TV 38 in Chicago. From the hustle and the bustle, bustle of the city, city To the calm of the countryside From the hurry and the flurry and the scurry of the city God is calling us aside As TV38 grew, the cost of doing business also grew. The burden of transmitter costs, rent, labor, and the constant need to invest in better television equipment was nearly overwhelming. Traditional fundraising efforts such as direct mail appeals and donor letters were used from TV38's earliest days. Well, my first day there at the office, I see all these ladies typing on index cards and what they were typing were the contributions, the name and addresses of the donors. And uh, they would keep it in some kind of a cardboard box. And <laughs> uh, that was uh, amusing. It wasn't entirely organized, but they did it. Jerry Rose sent me to IBM school, and we ordered our first IBM computer. It was like a heavy metal desk with a little screen on it, with about four lines of green characters over a black screen. Contribution names, addresses, amounts, rel relative information. And we would send that off to a company that would print that on green bar paper so that we would have a record of it and also print up receipts. We developed that system into a pretty impressive data processing department with larger computers. On-air fundraising was a primary method used to pay the bills at TV38. In 1949, early secular television star Milton Berle hosted the first ever broadcast television telethon for cancer research. By the 1970s, Americans had become familiar with the telethon format largely through the work of Jerry Lewis and his Labor Day muscular dystrophy telethons. But of course, telethon was a, a way for a particularly not-for-profit organization to let the viewers know, hey, we need support. We had a commercial license and we did run some commercials, but most of com the commercial slots were promotional slots. The trend at that time was to go directly to the viewers and say, 
will you help us? Will you be a part of this 38 family? I remember a couple of years after I started working at TV 38, I, I worked the Democratic National Convention, which was at the United Center. Me and another guy from TV 38, we were doing telethon in our minds because they didn't have anything planned. And we're just like shagging shots all over the place. He's talking about this. And so you need to go find that shot. One of the presidents of the news division called up the director and said, that was some of the best television I ever saw. And what, all we did between me and the other TV 38 guy was all we did was telethon. We have a brand new total, Nancy. Let's find oh, out good. what it is. Okay. 414,000. $200. When Christian television stations like WCFC TV 38 adopted the telethon format as a means of paying the bills, Chicago audiences recognized the format, including a total board, on-camera presenters, live music, and banks of telephones operated by volunteers. What was new was an unfiltered window into Pentecostal Christianity and theology. The PTL Television Network presents Jim Baker! As the charismatic renewal and as television developed at the same time, these two things brought Pentecostal spirituality into the broader Christian church. It became mainstream in many ways. Part of the phenomenon of this new Pentecostal and charismatic television was the fact that it was going on at the same time that there were new developments within Pentecostal charismatic theology. A vivid literalism in the way that they approach the Bible sometimes, taking God for his word at, you know, uh, in various passages about blessing and applying those to the individual and as something that, you know, God would never fail you. So these were rock-hard promises that uh, were to be found in the scriptures about blessing his people and that he would prosper you and that sort of thing. And uh, I think you begin to see sort of a, uh, a melding together of this sort of, uh, you know, faith movement at one level and also the dynamics of uh, fundraising. You know, if you're going to keep a broadcast organization going, whether it be an independent program, an independent station, as in uh, the case of WCFC Channel 38 Chicago, or a huge broadcast network like uh, the Christian Broadcasting Network, you had to have funds and you depended on your audiences to do that. Telethons were a necessary part of ministry to raise the funds to continue to work. All the staff contributed and many volunteers came in, gave up their time to answer phones and read pledges and all that kind of thing. It took a lot of money to do TV, to keep a transmitter on the air, to keep a station on the air, to employ the people they employed. And I think eventually it became, uh, there was so much emphasis on fundraising and um, trying to unite the area from that. And then just due to budgets, a lot of the local programming went away. Christian television for Chicago. This is WCFC TV 38. Broadcast syndication played an important role in the story of WCFC TV 38. Many of TV 38's locally produced programs, such as Shape Up with Nancy Larson, Toddler's Friends, Saturday Night Sing, Young at Heart, and A Closer Look were distributed nationally through a license to other broadcast Christian television stations without going through a broadcast network. As TV 38's programming engine revved up, the station's vision began to expand beyond Chicago. At the same time, paid daily syndicated programming from other Christian broadcasters eager to reach the Chicago market became an important revenue stream. Nightly programs like the PTL Club with Jim and Tammy Baker, Jerry Falwell's Old Time Gospel Hour, Pat Robertson's 700 Club, and Jimmy Swaggart accounted for a critical revenue stream for TV 38. I have sinned against you, my Lord. In the mid to late 1980s, when a spectacular series of scandal, intrigue, and public disgrace toppled some of the biggest names in Christian television broadcasting, TV 38 was faced with replacing thousands of dollars of predictable weekly revenue when those broadcasts were pulled from its program schedule. When the scandals happened, Jimmy Swaggart, uh, PTL, Marvin Gorman, 
they had a huge impact on us, not only on, on TV 38, because Jerry was instantly hit with, what do I do about programming? You know, these people were on our station, so what do I do with their program? It was, it was a huge decision, a lot of pressure, and believe me, it was prayerfully considered, but it, it really impacted our, our schedule on TV 38. One of the investigative reporters, a fellow named Jay Levine, came walking up to me and he said, uh, how is the Jimmy Swagger thing affecting you? And I said, well, you know, I, I don't think that much from a local standpoint. I said, but nationally, obviously, there are a lot of issues that are being dealt with. And he looked at me and he said, you know what? It's okay. You know, we don't identify you with the problem. It may not look like a television studio right now, but if all goes according to plan, WCFC TV. In January 1990, well I took a job with Don Hancock's Performance Communications and began a career in corporate video production, and my time at TV 38 came to an end. In the spring of 1991, WCFC TV 38 began moving into a newly constructed broadcast facility at 38 South Peoria on Chicago's near west side. The neighborhood was also home to Oprah Winfrey's Harpo Studios and was on the cutting edge of an urban renewal movement that continues today. The new facility, continued financial pressures, and syndicated programming led to a gradual shift in focus from local to national to global audiences. The reasons why the time for the broadcast entity known as WCFC TV 38 came to an end are paradoxical, especially when viewed from the eye of the beholder. They just lost the burden for Chicago. The reason the station was there was because I had wept over Chicago and, and the answer to my question, how can Chicago be reached, was a Christian TV station. So God put it there for Chicago. But when they lost the burden for Chicago and tried to make it a worldwide thing, then I don't think uh, I don't think that was where God intended it to be. As TV 38 expanded its programming outreach, new technologies like cable television, the shift from analog to digital broadcasting, and the emerging internet and World Wide Web spelled the end for Chicago's local Christian broadcast television station. Towards the end of the 90s, uh, we were seeing, I think, a great transition in... Uh, communication. It is softer. A channel five. For those who don't have a butler, Zenith suggests Space Command remote control. When we started, if you want to watch anything on television, you had eight opportunities in Chicago. So broadcasting dominated the marketplace. There was no cable. There was no internet. There were no VCRs. There were no clickers. You had none of that. And as a result, we were able to be very successful with what we did. Some 22 years later, as, as still as TV 38, all of those things existed in the marketplace. All of a sudden, things started changing radically. Probably the biggest curse of all was a, was a clicker. A person would go to their clicker, and they would click it to UHF, and they would go to another, another knob, and they would dial to our station, and then they would have to go back and sit down. And then if they didn't like it, three minutes, four minutes later, they would get up and would go. But you had that much sampling for your programming so you could get people into it. Uh, 22 years later, nothing moves but the thumb when I began to look at that and say, there's gonna be a new wave start. I, I would like for us to be a part of that new wave. Uh, the biggest thing to affect our ministry in the television in, in general was the uh, transition into the digital age. I recall some of the engineering people here in Chicago, a number of stations didn't know how they were gonna afford such a thing, including, I think, our management, Jerry, and the board. At that time, they were talking about digital television, massive amounts of money to upgrade to HD television and so forth. All of a sudden, I was seeing pretty radical differences happening in the marketplace and uh, wanted to try to anticipate and get ahead of that. Uh, so we made the decision to sell TV 38 and become the Total Living Network. In January 1998, Christian Communications of Chicagoland, Inc., 
the corporate expression of TV38, sold the transmitter and station license to Paxson Communications Corporation for a reported $120 million. Eventually, TV38 changed its name to the Total Living Network and moved out of the city of Chicago to the western suburbs and continued to create content distributed through cable television. I'm really grateful for my time at TV38. I'm happy they took a chance on me, a young kid with no production experience. I learned more at Channel 38 about television uh, than I've learned in all the years since. I'm also grateful that I met my wife, Beth, on the train coming into Chicago one day, and she worked in the Civic Opera Building. She actually uh, came to know the Lord. I have great memories of her supporting me, and after we were married, of her coming and picking me up at three in the morning from an edit suite, <laughs> um, just really supporting everything that I wanted to do back then. And TV38 was, I just have nothing but great memories. Those people that gave to TV38 and helped and prayed for TV38, those prayers and those efforts didn't go in vain. For those 22 years, whatever their involvement was, God used those people to affect people's lives. I thank God for the opportunity that I had uh, to work at TV38, to work with uh, some of the best people I've ever met in my life. And I thank God for what he gave me uh, as far as spirituality, because there were challenges, but there were also great victories. And I cannot say enough about the role that that station played in Christian lives here in the city of Chicago. When I look back on our years that we spent uh, working at TV 38, from the very beginning on up till the present, I'm amazed at how uh, God's hand has been so clearly in this, that ministry. Uh, we've seen ups and downs, we've seen a lot of uh, changes, but through it all, you know, God has remained faithful. It was this joint struggle that we worked together to make these things happen. When you see something on the air or somebody walks up to you and say, you know, I, I saw that show last week. We realized that it, that it was impacting people and it was amazing to be part of something that was bigger than you were. One of the greatest experiences at, at TV38 was the number of talented, dedicated people who came through, really lovely people, many of whom are still my friends. To me, that experience of, there were really literally hundreds of people that came through that station. Some stayed a long time and some stayed for a couple days, but they were always great people. And uh, that's, that's the thing that uh, I really remember the most. It was a privilege to work especially with the people. I look back at the people that talent and staff especially that we had, gosh, they've gone on to do great things. It became more, more than a ministry. It was a life, you know, people believed in this. Um, we didn't just think of this as a job. It was, it was, a, it was a ministry. The legacy of TV38 uh, made a, a great impression on a great number of people and many who are no longer with us and trust in glory as a result of the ministry in Owen Card's vision to reach the city. Certainly, I think it did that to a great extent, reach many people for Christ and uh, as in many other ministries and in churches, you know, a, a day is given to function and uh, then that uh, makes a transition either into something else or disappears and something else emerges. So uh, it made a lasting impression, I'm sure. I think it was the Lord. I think God put this together for a purpose and I, uh, for a a, a grand purpose during that time of the when the power of Christian television was really making an impact.